Welcome everyone and th thanks for joining us today. We are Hector and myself, Edgar Pardo, and today we are going to present and share our journey with Kubernetes cluster, managing them at, managing them at a scale, and particularly focusing on Kubernetes networking on, on those edge clusters. So both of us, both of us uh, are platform engineers working for Roche. And so, so first, a bit of presentation about Roche for those of, of you who doesn't know Roche yet. It's a pharma company with more than 100,000 employees across the world, which has two big divisions. Diagnostics, which is the division that takes care of building the instruments, that takes blood analysis and any kind of test on the laboratories, and the devices that interact with those instruments for running process the data, running software on top, and process like kind of algorithms for processing that data. And then there is the second division, which is the pharma one that develops the medicines that treat the patients. So, how was working uh, in the past, like Roche, uh, given that it's present in thousands of laboratories across the world, which apart from having those instruments, has the devices that interact with those instruments. Every time that they needed to, like they had the need of deploying a new algorithm or software to interact with those instruments, like for that blur analysis, like given that they need to process that data and apply some uh, data sets, uh, they were like, they were assigning a team for that, and that team had to brought its own device to the laboratory. This means like another device, and on top of that, uh, develop that uh, algorithm. And then potentially, if needed, they were building their own solution of logging as well, monitoring, and whatever need that the business uh, were requiring. Then the problem was that we ended up having like dozens of uh, devices on the laboratory to interact with those instruments. Uh, making it super hard to automate stuff and like every every device had different libraries, different languages and for people who, uh, with our role that wanted to automate everything, it was kind of a nightmare. So then this is where our team came in to going to the second approach where we have like single platform, single device where all software development teams inside Roche can deploy its software, making it like single way, like a single approach for deploying and like maintaining a single platform. So basically we are like an internal platform inside Roche that our goal is to be present on all the places that Roche has instruments and devices, that is uh, laboratories, hospital, doctor offices and so on, and basically managing clusters at the scale uh, on the edge. But managing those clusters at the edge comes with many challenges because as you can imagine, the storage solution there, uh, backup and especially networking, we, like comes with a lot of challenges when you don't own the, the network. The, given that those clusters, the laboratories, are, doesn't belong to Roche, we are just inside a private network that we do not manage, plus we don't manage the firewall, so it comes like everything is handed or offloaded to the customer. And yeah, so on the other hand, we need to connect to many external services because those edge clusters are not air gap, so they need to interact with uh, a container, like, uh, sorry, a cluster that we have on regional, uh, like a regional cluster that we have, Kubernetes one deployed on a cloud provider, AWS, and for China, AliCloud. And there is where we deployed our internal API to interact with those clusters, GitOps repositories. From there, the clusters are pulling all the, uh, all the configuration and also like a container, container registry for pulling images and so on. So those clusters need to connect to many external services. And as you can imagine, given that we were not managing the firewall, this ended up like every time we had to deploy a new cluster on a laboratory on the field, we, were, we, we needed to ask for another ingress rule, like ingress rule for allowing traffic and so on. Uh, and again, it was becoming a nightmare to handle all of that. And so we ended up like uh, reserving a static range inside Roche uh, for dev like for exposing all our uh, requirements or all our external services. And we were leveraging Cloudflare uh, for that so that we could leverage every CDN feature like web application firewall, rate limiting and so on. So on the layout you can see that whatever it's not matching our range, a static range was not allowed by 
by the firewall and then dropped. And then if it was matching our static IP range, then we were allowed to connect to the regional clusters. But this was not covering all the use cases uh, because the software development teams had, for instance, like needed for connecting to a webhook for alerting, like sending data reports to SaaS platform and so on, and even like connecting any cloud service that we do not own, right? On AWS, we do not own the range. So for that, we were not covering all the use cases, so yet we had like limited support for that. And as, again, so if we go back to the scenario where we needed to ask every customer on every firewall to create a new rule, given the amount of clusters we are managing, this was not scaling again. So this is our legacy solution we built for that. And yeah, so some of the services, the ones that had like a common scenario, we were proxifying them through Cloudflare, kind of a reverse proxy, as Cloudflare was allowing us to do it. But some of the services uh, that like the software development teams had were working like on layer 4, TCP, UDP, and we were not able to support them because Cloudflare does, doesn't support them through that uh, proxifying feature. And there were also like additional applications that needed to do some modification of the headers on fly before forwarding it to external services. And again, this was not covered by Cloudflare. And so we ended up placing a second reverse proxy on our regional Kubernetes cluster. There we do, were doing the header modification and then forwarding it to the original request. But again, this came with many uh, manual stuff to do because every time there was a new scenario or request coming from the teams, as they, like, they needed to connect to another external services, we needed to study that case and check if it was supported by our uh, Cloudflare or offloading it to our regional reverse proxy and coming with many manualities. So then we ended up like contacting with the Cilium guys. Thank you, Edgar. So uh, Cilium was becoming uh, the de facto networking solution uh, for Kubernetes by that time. So we approached them and explained them our problem. And they came with a very interesting idea. So what if um, you could manage your network traffic declaratively um, with network policies, not only to secure the traffic, but also to forward that specific traffic that you need uh, to a proxy that you can configure in many ways. Like, for example, creating a WebSocket tunnel uh, to a backend where you already have access to from, the, from your edges and encapsulating the original request inside that. So it looked very interesting to us. So yeah, we started a POC with Cilium and we are here today giving this talk. So yeah, it went very well. <laughs> Uh, but let's gonna um, step back for a moment and, and revisit what is a Cilium Service Mesh for the people that is uh, less familiar with it. Um, Cilium Service Mesh uh, is, put it simple, a set of features that allows to do advanced networking stack stuff. Um, eBPF is a framework, uh, well, it relies heavily in eBPF, and eBPF is a framework that allows to uh, load and run progress in a secure and dynamic way in the, into the Linux kernel. So basically, it's extending the um, uh, Linux kernel on the way. And for our solution, we are using basically two features from Cilium Service Messes, Cilium Network Policies and Cilium Envoy Configs. Uh, what are Cilium Network Policies? So they are basically Kubernetes Network Policies on asteroids. Uh, they work not only at layer three and layer four, but also at layer seven. And this means that you can filter traffic um, not only by IP and port. For example, uh, you could potentially block an HTTP request that is missing some HTTP headers, for example. Um, what happens is that when uh, you create a Cilium network policy, Cilium is configuring an eBPF program um, for that particular pod, namespace, or cluster, depending how you configure the network policy. And uh, when traffic is coming from the user space, um, then this, tra uh, the, this eBPF program is executing the um, logic of the policy. So, for example, if you wanted to allow the traffic, then it will forward or redirect the traffic to the Linux networking stack. If you wanted to, do, to deny it, it will just block it. And if you want to redirect it to an Envoy proxy, then it will do that. And we will come back to that in a moment because this is one of the new features. Uh, Cilium Envoy configs. Um, first of all, uh, Cilium runs one unique Envoy proxy instance uh, per Kubernetes cluster node. So this means that there are no sidecars. And what happened is that when you create a Cilium Envoy config, um, it creates basically an Envoy listener in this particular Envoy proxy instance. 
An envoy listener, also called envoy namespace, um, can carry, let's say that can carry individual configurations and operate independently in this um, instance. Um, put it very simple, envoy listeners are to envoy as C groups and namespaces are to Linux. And yeah, they have basically these two CRDs, the namespace resource and the Cilium cluster wide envoy config that is applied to the whole cluster. Coming back to our new solution, um, the thing was that Cilium service mess was not ready just yet by that time. So Isovalent has to develop new features to make it happen and being able to use this WebSocket tunneling feature. Uh, the first feature was to enrich Cilium network policies uh, with the capabilities of redirecting traffic, that the traffic that you mm, want and you define in the network policy, to an envoy listener that is defined in a Cilium um, envoy config. And then additionally it was needed uh, to create uh, a couple of envoy filters uh, for doing the WebSocket tunneling functionality. So one, it was the WebSocket client, which we use in our uh, Edge clusters. This one is in charge of establishing the WebSocket and encapsulating the original request inside it. And then the other one was the WebSocket server that we run in our regional clusters. And this is doing the WebSocket termination and then encapsulation of the request. Uh, these are where uh, use cases that we have today. So the first one is the edge to cloud connectivity. Um, here is where we have an edge cluster in uh, customer premises and they have a firewall, uh, as Edgar was mentioning before, that is only allowing traffic to our uh, set of uh, ROS IPs that we have exposed in Cloudflare. So for this particular case, we will use the WebSocket encapsulation uh, tunnel. Then we have a customer proxy scenario uh, is Kind of similar, but then the customer uh, doesn't have a firewall that is blocking the traffic, but in fact, they have a forward proxy uh, out of some regulations, and they require that uh, all the traffic that is leaving the customer premises has to be forwarded to that proxy. And then we have another scenario, which is both of them, uh, which is much more complex. Uh, we will not go through it today, uh, but if you are curious about that, we can talk uh, after the talk. Okay, so use case number one, uh, edge to cloud connectivity. So let's say that we have an application running in a pod uh, into a specific namespace and we want to reach an S3 bucket. Uh, the edge cluster is behind the firewall and the firewall is blocking this access by default. So yeah, it, it, the, the traffic will not go, no? So for this scenario, we are leveraging the Cilium service mesh to use the WebSocket tunneling feature. How it looks like. So this is mainly how it looks like. So go, let's go side by side. So first on the right side there, uh, you can see that, uh, I mean, we need to, to run the WebSocket tunneling, uh, the WebSocket termination uh, envoy proxy in a place uh, where the edge cluster has access to, right? So we are running this uh, WebSocket termination envoy proxy in our regional EKS clusters in Amazon, and we are exposing it through Cloudflare in our ROS bring your own IP range, because the edge cluster has access to this range already. Um, we are enforcing MTLS, uh, and again, um, if you want to, um, um, to see in detail how we are uh, enforcing it, then after the talk we can talk about that. Um, and then, on the, on the left side, for the edge cluster, what we have is, first of all, a Cilium cluster-wide uh, envoy config. Um, there we are loading the WebSocket client filter that is doing the WebSocket encapsulation. We are injecting the MTLS client certificate, uh, so that Cloudflare can, uh, can verify and allow the traffic. And then finally, uh, in the namespace of the, uh, of the pod running the application that needs to connect to S3 bucket, uh, we have the Cilium network policy that is, for this particular traffic, redirecting the traffic to the Cilium envoy config. Um, okay, so this is the Cilium network policy. Let's gonna see then uh, now in detail how it looks like. So here what we are saying basically in this network policy is for A please, for all the traffic that is going to amazonaws.com, uh, please don't send it to the Linux networking stack and instead send it to this envoy listener that is running in this uh, uh, Cilium cluster wide envoy config. Then we have the Cilium envoy config configuration and for those in the, room, uh, in the room that are not familiar with envoy, in envoy you basically define envoy listeners and envoy clusters. In the listeners uh, is basically for the request that is coming, you can apply many filters. And then the cluster is uh, where you define the upstream, where you are sending the request to. Um, so, yeah, so here in the envoy listener part of the Cilium cluster wide envoy config, you can see that we are leveraging the WebSocket client envoy filter developed by Isovalent. Uh, that is the one that is establishing the WebSocket and doing the encapsulation of the original request inside the tunnel. 
And then in the Envoy cluster, here we are injecting the MTLS client certificate uh, for validation with Cloudflare, and finally uh, specifying the destination, which is the WebSocket termination endpoint. This other so Envoy config configuration corresponds uh, to the WebSocket termination that we are running in our EKS regional clusters. And here we are using, uh, as you can see, the, the WebSocket server Envoy filter, uh, which is doing the, basically the WebSocket termination and an encapsulation of the original request. So yeah, finally, we migrated to Cilium. All our uh, its clusters are running uh, Cilium uh, today. Uh, and with that, we increase the network performance. We level up uh, the network security and observability with uh, Hubble, which is a tool part of the Cilium family. And at the very end, we brought the firewall closer um, uh, to our workloads uh, to be able to manage this edge to cloud network traffic that we needed following GitOps approach uh, in a secure way. So now it's demo time. Uh, Edgar will walk us through uh, a quick demo about the scenario number two, the customer proxy, and you will see it in action. Thanks, Hector. So before starting, I want to mention that we have prepared a repository which is publicly accessible uh, with the whole demo that contains Makefile and a readme with all the steps so you can follow it yourself and play it, like do it yourself. And before starting like with the, the CLI, like let me explain you the setup that we have prepared, which is covering the second scenario that Ed Hector was explaining, where there is no firewall, but there is a forward proxy that the laboratory or the hospital requires that all the traffic goes through before leaving the, the customer premises. So basically, we have prepared on the left side an EC2 instance where we are hosting like Kubernetes cluster, where the security groups are only allowing egress traffic to the second EC2 instance, which is like the one that has deployed this fo forward proxy, which is just a Docker container. And the second machine is the one that uh, has egress connectivity to the outside world, like 0, 0, 0, 0 range. Then going back to the, to the first uh, EC2 instance where we have the cluster, we have prepared tune and spaces. The first one, like the test deny one, doesn't have any kind of Cilium network policy, neither Cilium envoy config. And so whenever he tries to reach Roche.com, he will be dropped out because there is no egress connectivity to that address. But then we have the second namespace, test allow, where we will be configuring a Cilium network policy plus the Cilium memory config where we're going to the redirect the traffic to, which will go over like through the proxy IP and then like reaching the internet after that. So there we have like let okay. It's very small, right? So let me zoom. Do you see it now? Okay. So here is like just we have prepared the cluster for, for the demo. And there we have the tune space that we have mentioned before, the test allow and test the I one, where on each of them we have prepared just a curl pod, like test one, that will allow just uh, like to show you that whether or not there is connectivity to the outside world. So that, that is like simple image. And then at the moment, there is no Cilium network policy deployed on the cluster. And there is neither like Cilium envoy config, so you will see. So if we try, like for that, we have prepared a makefile to make it easy to follow and quicker. So if we try to reach the like rose.com and so yeah, so we receive a timeout, like that command, like the make command that we have prepared is just executing into the pod and just testing like whether or not there is connectivity to ROS.com. And the same goes with the make test deny. Again, this one will just drop out because there is no, like in that one, we don't even need to configure anything. And now there is the second, uh, like third command that we have prepared where we'll be applying the manifest. Yeah, so now, like the command is just connecting to the machine and just applying the Cilium Envoy config plus the Cilium network policy that will allow us to reach the internet, right? So now, if we run again the command, yeah, so now we receive like 200 HTTP code because of the policies, right? So let me uh, explain a bit like how like the policy look like.
Yeah, basically, uh, as Hector was mentioning before, on the Cilium network policy, we are like creating this egress rule that says, hey, whatever matches ROS.com, please. Oh. Okay, now, fine. So, whatever matches ROS.com, please do not send it to the Linux uh, networking stat, but please send it to the Cilium Envoy config that we have prepared. And then, if we go to the Cilium Envoy config that we have prepared, Again, like Hector mentioned it before, for those of you who are not familiar with the Silum Envoy config files, there you can configure listeners, which is basically where you apply filters, and then the cluster, which is basically the upstream where you are sending the request to. So in that case, we, what we have prepared is listener that has the following TCP proxy Envoy filter, that is it's the one that where we are configuring the tunneling config and then because of that what we are doing is opening a TCP tunnel over HTTP connect and then like saying hey send the request to the original hostname and there is where we are saying okay send it to the cluster which is the upstream where we have like the following endpoint like saying hey forward it to the following address right and this IP is exactly the one that host yeah. So this is the IP of the proxy, so the second EC2 instance where we are forwarding the traffic to. And then if we run it again, there we have the, like we are connected to the to the other machine, the EC2 where we are hosting the proxy. And then, I think this one is small as well. So this is just, I'm just docker log, so tailing the, the, the logs to see it in live. If we run again, make test allow. And we go here, we can see on the timestamp, like we are here on the message, like we are opening a HTTP connect request to the original destination, which is the IP like of rush.com. Yeah, and that would be the demo. So going back here, like this is the, the manifest that I have explained before. So nothing to pay attention here. And yeah, Hector, so. So yeah, one last thing, and is Isovalent released uh, one new lab last week. Uh, it's uh, about layer seven Envoy proxy at PAN features. Part of the of the features that we have demo today are uh, are included in this lab. And yeah, I mean, I know that Isovalent has put a lot of love in this laboratory. So yeah, I really recommend you to do. If you do it during this week here in the KubeCon in their booth, uh, I think that you will get um, a batch, a golden batch sticker. So very cool as well. And with this, uh, this is everything we have for today. Thank you very much. Uh, you can give feedback here and uh, we will be around the whole week. So if you want to, yeah, if you have any questions apart from the meeting today and so on, uh, just stop by, say hello, and it will be a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you. And, and I think we have time for a few questions if people have questions in the room. Can you also connect the other way around from your systems towards the each node? Is there a tunnel in the other way? So we have like kind of a reverse proxy deployed on the edge. This is not has nothing to do with CNI, but we have a reverse proxy deployed as an agent running on the edge clusters where we are opening a uh, web socket uh, connection like TCP forwarding for reaching the edge clusters as well. So yeah, we have an edge running on, on the agents. Sorry, we have an agent running on the edges to reach them as well. In so case of disaster or whatever, we need to connect to them. Yeah. So no normal VPN connection. No, 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 no. There is no, no. So we are doing TCP forwarding and. Yeah. So, uh, for this solution, what we have is this other service that we need is part of our uh, range of IPs uh, that we have in in Cloudflare. So already the edge cluster has access to that and to establish the reverse tunnel. Yes, yeah, so, so, so it's deployed on our regional cluster, so same static range. Yeah, but the connection is not opening from the, let's say, from the regional cluster, but the other way around. So it's the edge which initiates the, con like the connectivity. So that's why we are able to reach it. Hi, uh, thanks very much for the talk. Really interesting. Um, I'm curious about what's doing the translation or the wrapping of the TCP traffic and WebSocket in both cases. Is that done by Envoy and then the cloud unwrapping it? And is that the same for the tunnel that you just mentioned that goes the other way? So for, for the first scenario that you have mentioned, yes, yeah, so the filters that Silum prepared for, for us are doing that translation and so on. And the second one you mentioned, the, you mean the agent that is running on the edges? 
Yeah, the one that you use to send requests from, you know, centrally. Into no, so for this one, it's different agent that we have that has nothing to do with the Cilium CNI. Yeah. Something you so wrote yourself. Or? Yeah, yeah. So it's just TCP forwarding, like opening the connectivity from the edge, connecting to the agent that it's running as well on the regional cluster. Like it, this one is listening, and whenever the connectivity has started, then like there is kind of a tunnel from there where like sending the traffic to, but there is no encapsulation there. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, here, in the first, second row. Thank you, great speech. Uh, when you were terminating the TLS, can you maybe just give some insights where you actually do the termination? Because it's not sure. translated, I guess. So do you mean for the enforcement of the NTLS? Yes. So basically what we are using there is Cloudflare Access. I don't know if you know, but um, there what we do is well, for creating the certificates and so on, we have a root PKA, a secret engine. We have it in Vault in, in one separate instance of Vault. And then uh, for the regional clusters, we run a dedicated Vault instance also in the regional clusters. So for each of them, um, there we create a PKA intermediate, CA basically, and then with, with their manager into the DH clusters, we connect to that to issue the client certificates, basically. These are renewed every seven days. And then they are being injected into the Cilium Envoy configs when they are establishing the WebSocket tunnel. Uh, because this communication is then um, in Cloudflare Access, we enforce the NTLS and we validate against the root CA that we have. And then the traffic is being validated there. Uh, historically, it has been quite a manual work with certification. Do you, do you use SAT Manager or something like this? Yeah, well, yeah, we use SAT Manager for, the, for issuing the certificates against the intermediate PKI, yes. And yeah, th this certificate is stored in the uh, Cilium Secrets namespace, and from there the Cilium Envoy config is fetching it and injecting it. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, okay we have time for one last question. Um, uh, during the demo, I believe I've seen some SSH connection. Uh, is it a perfect? personal preference or is it impossible to fully configure it th purely through manifests? Uh, well, yeah, so the make file, on, I mean, the command that we have there, are, I mean, it's just for, for the demo, right? So we are connecting to the machine just to apply the manifest, but yeah, so it's just for the demo purposes. Yeah, but you have like K get nodes and stuff like that. You had access to control panel. Why wouldn't you use uh, just kubectl directly instead of SSH? Yeah, it's just personal preference. Yeah, we could do that with the kube config directly. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you.